Welcome to a very topical Learn at Lunch session. I'm Hanson Robbins, Chair of the WCL Special Events Committee, and in that capacity, responsible for arranging speakers for our Learn at Lunch series. The pandemic has forced us to offer Learn at Lunch talks via Zoom sessions. We lose the pleasure of sharing food with like-minded friends, but thankfully, we can take the opportunity to see our speakers and hear what they have to say. I welcome you all to our third Zoom, Zoom Learn at Lunch featuring Dr. Melissa Deckman. First, some housekeeping terms, items before we begin. If you haven't done so, please mute yourselves after you sign on. The mute symbol is at the bottom or the side edge of your screen. You may unmute yourselves at the question and answer session following her remarks. I've asked my friend Dan Primo to introduce Melissa. Dan, a retired Washington College professor and close friend of Melissa, preceded me as the most excellent chairman of the Special Events Committee. I learned the ropes of how to do this job from him. Dan, I turn the floor over to you. Dan? Yes, can you see me? No, I see you. Okay, well, thank you, Hanson, for those kind words. And I also thank you for inviting me to introduce today's speaker. Many of you may remember Professor Deckman from her participation on the Goldstein panel last month that discussed how gender, race, and ethnicity will shape the presidential race. From the WCL flyer the, announcing today's program, we already know that Dr. Dickman is chair of the political science department and also the Goldstein professor of public affairs. The flyer also listed her uh, major publications and the courses she teaches, but I'd like to supplement that information by noting that she graduated summa cum laude from St. Mary's College in 1993. Her major, of course, was political science. She did her graduate work in American University where she received her PhD in political science in August, 1999. One of the joys of retiring in Chestertown is that my wife Rita and I have had the pleasure to maintain our friendship and follow the careers of former colleagues at the college. That applies especially to the four members of the political science department who were hired during my tenure as chair. Tahir Shad, Andrew Orles, Christine Wade, and Melissa have been like family to us over the years. And I could not be prouder of their academic achievements and their service to the college. I met Melissa in September 1999, when John Taylor and I interviewed her in Atlanta for a position in the American government. From the 40 or so candidates we met over several days, Melissa was by far our first choice. The department was elated when she accepted the college's offer. I've never asked Melissa if Washington College was her first choice. But the fact that she's still here after 20 years suggests it was a good fit. Her talk today could not be more timely, nor could it be more challenging for any political scientist. But as one of her biggest fans and cheerleaders, I'm confident that if anyone can do it, Melissa can, and here she is. Dan, thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, you know, Dan, of course, and John Taylor hired me. Now it's been, I hate to say, 21 years ago <laughs> uh, for this wonderful job at Washington College. It certainly was my first choice. I am a um, product, a proud product of the liberal arts experience. I'm very passionate about that. And um, 
it's really been a wonderful place for my career. So in, in part because of Dan Primo. And so it's just a delight to, to have him introduce me today. So thank you very much, Dan, for those really kind, kind words. So I'm gonna to speak today about the outcome of the election. Um, and really the outcome is clear. We can talk a little bit toward the end about what I will nicely call shenanigans by a certain uh, member in the White House right now in terms of trying to delay the obvious. And we can talk about that if you want at the end. But my, uh, my talk is really gonna focus on the results of the election. It's sort of a part two to the talk that I gave earlier in terms of the Goldstein um, uh, uh, talk uh, back in October. Did what we said, what we said at that event, did it actually materialize? So I have some data to share with you to see how accurate or not accurate maybe we were at that, that event um, and talk about some general trends, what changed from 2016 to, to 2020. Um, and so I'm gonna do that through a PowerPoint first. Uh, if you have questions along the way, um, the Zoom does allow you, if you click on participants button, there's like a raise your hand feature, feel free to raise your hand. Um, there's also a chat feature. You can write a question. I'll do my best to try to monitor that as we're going along. Um, but probably the best is to, to maybe, um, I'm gonna speak a little closer to the mic. Someone asked for that. Is that better? Can you hear me a little bit better? Okay, um, and then um, we'll have definitely a question and answer session with the idea that we're gonna stop around one o'clock today. So I'm gonna share with you my PowerPoint here. This should come up in just a second. All right, so you should see, for those of you seeing a, um, a, a line of, of views at the end, like on the right-hand side, if you go up to the very top, you can toggle along. And if you hit the button that's next to the two blue lines, that should minimize um, some of what you're seeing here. So, and if you do the very, very left-hand most tiny button there, that'll hide the um, thumbnail videos there. So you can kind of take a look at the whole screen. All right, so let's begin. So I'm gonna start by talking first about the electoral college map in terms of which states were won by Biden this year, which states flipped and talk a little bit about some important trends there. I also wanna talk a bit today about the unprecedented voter turnout we saw in 2020 um, and how that also I think was linked to the results of the election. Then I'm gonna to move towards some of the exit poll findings, which give us sort of an initial idea of how different groups in society voted. Um, specifically, I'm gonna look at factors like party, gender, religion, race, ethnicity, um, education levels, and age. And then I thought I'd conclude by talking very briefly about the race for Congress, because of course the presidential election was the, the um, election that most people are talking about and most people are paying the most attention to, but we also, of course, um, had a congressional election as well. And so we'll talk about where we are with respect to, to Congress, and then we'll open it up to some questions. All right. So here is a final electoral college map uh, in terms of the projected winner of the electoral college here. Uh, Biden, in fact, basically flipped the number of electoral college votes from Donald Trump in 2016. Trump ended up winning about 306 and Biden ended up winning 306 according to projections. Currently, I, I sort of did this presentation over the weekend and so the vote totals are a little bit different, um, but essentially Biden now has a popular vote lead of about 4%, roughly five and a half million votes uh, stand between Biden and Trump. And there still could be a change in that as absentee and overseas ballots continue to be uh, processed here. Um, but a couple of things to, to take note of, especially in comparison to 2016, is that when it comes to what many political scientists and pundits call the blue wall, um, the reason that Biden won was because he was able to uh, pick off Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, which were surprise states in 2016 that Trump was able to, to win unexpectedly. He also flipped the states of Arizona and Georgia. And this is really notable because no uh, Democratic presidential candidate has won those states since the early 1990s. And so that I think was definitely a very big, um, a big reason that Joe Biden won the election. It's also notable that in some of the other key battleground states, 
Trump actually expanded his lead. So Trump did better in 2020 in the states of Ohio and Florida. And Florida, especially because of some unexpected strength in the Latino vote, which we can talk about a little bit later. Trump, however, lost some support in Texas and of course, narrowly in North Carolina, which was finally called for Trump uh, a few days ago. Um, but compared to the vote totals, it looks as though Biden's vote total is going to be larger over Trump than Trump's was over Hillary Clinton. In, in, where actually Clinton won more of the popular vote, but Biden's uh, vote is, is, is wider over Donald Trump than, than uh, Clinton's vote in the popular vote total was over Donald Trump. And part of that is a reflection of the fact that um, we didn't have re really any serious uh, third party candidates running. In, in 2016, whereas Gary Johnson took about two, one to two percent of the overall vote total, and that probably um, also hindered uh, Clinton's ability to win that election in 2016. The other big story, though, as a political scientist that I'm really interested in is looking at the very high rates of voter turnout. And this is among people who are voting eligible in the US population. I like this map. So I follow a professor named Michael McDonald at the University of Florida. He has a center there called the US Elections Project. And he looks at turnout and vote choice longitudinally. And he has data that shows in 1900, uh, the vote uh, voter turnout was probably close to 75%. That's sort of the high watermark in terms of the data that's been collected. In 2020, the turnout is estimated to be probably about 67%. And that's the highest since 1900. So I think that Donald Trump is sort of um, a candidate who uh, has driven turnout on both sides of the aisle, right? He has certainly turned out his base in record numbers. And then of course, um, the counter protests to Donald Trump among many Democrats, you see record levels of, of voting happening in this election. However, turnout by state is very different. Um, I actually found this map, which I think was really interesting looking at how the, the rates of voter turnout overall. So in some states like Colorado, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, you had upwards of almost 80% of, of eligible voters turning out to vote. Um, whereas states such as Oklahoma um, had you know, fewer than 50% of eligible voters voting here. But there's a couple of trends to take note of here. So currently five states allow for, have only mail-in election uh, voting. Two of those states, well, three of those states are Washington, Oregon, and Colorado. And not surprisingly, they have some of the highest uh, voter turnout to be had. Because when you make the process easier in terms of voting, you tend to have more people going out to vote. M Minnesota and Wisconsin also have very um, liberal policies in the sense that you can actually show up at the polls the day of and register to vote here. Other states make it very, very difficult to vote, especially um, during this age of COVID. So for example, Mississippi, which is one of the lower voter turnout states, it's recognized as the hardest place to vote in America. It does not permit any early voting and voters have to register 30 days before an election. So there's definitely a linkage between voting regulations, who's eligible to vote, the timeline for that sort of thing, and the ease with which you make voting accessible, and overall levels of turnout around the country. I am currently working on a book about Generation Z, so I've been following a lot about younger voters this election cycle, so I think this is really notable as well. Uh, Tufts University has a center called Circle where they follow the youth vote uh, historically. And in 2016, the youth vote made up about 16% of the electorate. And so exit polls are suggesting that they made up at least 17% of the electorate, 18 to 29 year olds. This is how they define the youth vote here. And as you can see from this table, we're gonna return to this in a few minutes, but 60% of youngers, these are, would be older, this would be younger millennials and Gen Z, um, voted for Joe Biden. Uh, Biden also got a slight majority of 30 to 44 year olds, whereas votes slightly went for Donald Trump among older Americans here. But with the youth vote, um, this I think is pretty, pretty significant. Um, in 2016, the final estimate by circle for youth voter turnout was 45 to 48%. And they're projecting that in fact, it'll be between 53 and 56% when it's all said and done. So a lot of people have been looking to Gen Z as a generation that's more involved in politics. My book is really gonna focus on the political engagement of young women, because women are surging young women in terms of engagement. But certainly there's some initial estimate that Gen Z seems to be more willing to vote um, 
comparatively to previous younger generations. So I think that's an interesting point that I'm gonna be following very closely. Next, I wanted to show you a bit of the vote breakdown by party. Um, this should not come as any surprise <laughs> that people who are partisan tend to vote for uh, the candidates that they support, right? So 94% of Democrats uh, voted for Joe Biden and 94% of Republicans voted for uh, Donald Trump here. Um, so for those of you looking for a Lincoln Project effect, right, this is a much uh, a talked about organization led by people like Kellyanne Conway's husband, George Conway, um, others, Republicans who are never Trumpers, people that aren't supportive of Donald Trump. They've spent massive amounts of money running ads this election cycle, trying to basically get people to vote for Joe Biden. The reality is from 2016 to 2020, Trump's support among Republicans actually grew. He only got 88% of Republican support in 2016, according to the exit polls, and he's gone up to 94%. I think the way that party really matters in terms of the overall outcome of this election, though, is really looking at independence, which tends to happen a lot, right? The independent vote is critical to Biden winning, and not surprisingly, uh, Biden won 54% of the independent vote compared to 41% for, for Trump. In 2016, by contrast, Donald Trump actually won among independents 46 to 42%. I think I have two chats here. Um, yes, I'll, I'll kind of, that's about voter turnout. And we'll talk maybe about New York a little bit later. Okay. So I wanted to just introduce you to one theory in American politics that helps to explain why we're so polarized by party. Um, and um, then we'll return to looking at some, some of the exit polls and some other uh, data here. So we are, of course, in an unprecedented era of what some scholars call negative partisanship. And this is a, a, coin, a term that was coined by the political scientist Alan Abramowitz, who's at Emory University. And a couple of years ago, um, after the 2016 election, he wrote a book with Stephen Webster, who also is at Emory University. And this is what they had to say in their examination about party polarization. Over the past few decades, American politics has become like a bitter sports rivalry. Dislike of the opposing party and its leaders reflects a growing divide between Democrats and Republicans over a wide range of economic and social issues. And here's what's really important. The, the key finding that they come up with is that Americans increasingly are voting against the opposing party more than they're voting for their own party. And here's an important data point here to show you this. So they look at longitudinal data from the American National Election Study. And this is a very popular, well-known um, study that has been undertaken by the University of Michigan really since the early 1950s at the dawn of survey research. Um, it's used by political scientists all the time. My students are using it for a project right now in empirical political research. So it's very well-trusted, relied upon data. And one of the things that the ANES does is they use something called a feeling thermometer and they ask respondents and voters to rank candidates or parties or political institutions or movements on a scale of zero to 100. And so 100, if you basically think that uh, Joe Biden, if you ranked Joe Biden at 100, obviously that's the most warm you could feel toward a candidate. If you ranked Donald Trump uh, zero, that means that you're the most unfavorable. 50 is considered to be neutral here. And so this is data from, uh, from their book. It was actually profiled in the New York Times, but from 1968, right, the election of, of Nixon over McGovern, here, 77% um, of voters basically said that they had, that was the average temperature they felt, which is pretty warm, right, on a scale of zero to 100, toward their own party's candidate. But in, in 1968, um, the feeling toward the other person was 56%, right? So obviously less warm because it's a different party, but certainly not uh, overtly negative feeling about the other candidate. And so a couple of things are happening though in American politics overall. Over time, with the exception of 2016, which I'll get to in a minute, partisans tend to view their own party's candidate very similarly. Like three and four are willing to say that they feel pretty warm, right? Like 75 is typically an average value. It did drop off in 2016 because both Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were extremely unpopular overall, right? So you do see a little bit of a drop off. But when you look at the other guy, this is what I think is troubling about American politics and why we're in, I think, the state that we're in. Really, 
uh, over the past you know, 30 years, but especially since 2008. Um, people tend to like their own party, but they really, really dislike the other party. And in 2016, right, um, Republicans basically had an average feeling of Hillary uh, Clinton at 12 on a scale of zero to, to, to 100, and Democrats had an average feeling of, of 12 toward Donald Trump. And so it's this trend that's really getting at, I think, party polarization. When you hate the other guy or the gal more than your own party. And I think it's led to some really um, pretty destructive forces in American politics. And we'll get to that maybe a little bit later. All right, let's take a look at the vote breakdown, however, um, among different groups. And this is, gets back to the talk that um, we gave at the Goldstein Lecture uh, back in October. So I, of course, write a lot about women in politics. Um, that's sort of my bread and butter in terms of research here. Uh, in 2020, it looks as though the gender gap, which we define as the percentage of female votes minus male votes for the winning candidate, is going to be 12%. 57% of women voted for Donald Trump, I'm sorry, Joe, Joe Biden, compared to 45% who voted for uh, Joe Biden. And that difference mathematically is 12%. That's the highest gender gap in modern history. And so I think that that is not surprising, giving lots of stories which showed that women were far less likely to back Donald Trump than men. Um, I think, in fact, one of the more interesting stories in this election, I think there's going to be a lot of articles and papers written about the male vote this year as opposed to the female vote because Joe Biden actually did better with some groups of men, white men, whereas Donald Trump actually outperformed compared to 2016 with men of color. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But generally speaking, gender differences alive and well in this election cycle. However, of course, um, you have to kind of dig into the data a little bit deeper because we know that men and women are not monolithic when it comes to their vote choice because race and ethnicity also matter as well. And so here we find that Donald Trump did best among white men who made up 35% of the electorate um, and 55% of white women made up about 32% of the electorate this year. Um, that of course is very similar to what we saw in 2016. Um, in turn, the strongest support that Biden had was from black women, 90% of the exit poll data showing that black women voted for, for Joe Biden. Um, Latina women over here, sorry about the, the little fade uh, in the, the chart, um, seven in 10 voted for, for Joe Biden. Um, however, Donald Trump did so maybe somewhat ex unexpectedly better among black men and among Latino men compared to 2016. And a lot of people have been talking about this phenomenon as, as well. Overall, however, I think it's important to recognize that the strong majorities of Latinos and African-Americans voted for Joe Biden, whereas very solid majorities of white Americans voted for, for Donald Trump. Um, yet again, another way to slice and dice the data is to think about gender and education levels here. So whereas on the previous chart, for example, we saw that a majority of white women tended to vote for Donald Trump, um, it really is split depending on whether or not there is a college degree involved. So white college graduate women, 54% voted for, for Joe Biden compared to 63% of white women without a college degree. And once again, like the last election cycle, the strongest level of support for Donald Trump came from white men who don't have a college degree. Interestingly though, Biden was able to peel away some of the vote total from Donald Trump among white college uh, educated men. And so that's one trend that was pretty interesting to, to see. Um, I also have to talk about the religion vote. I write a lot about religion and politics as well. Um, and of course, um, I think everybody is very interested in the phenomenon of evangelicals, white evangelicals, I should say, and their support for, for Donald Trump. Um, and just like 2016, they were probably the biggest um, part of Donald Trump's voting coalition. Estimates are that between 76 and 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump in the election. Um, the other thing, getting back to the theme of voter turnout, is that uh, my friend Robbie Jones, who's head of the Public Religion Research uh, in uh, Institute, PRI, likes to say that white evangelicals kind of um, vote above above their 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 weight, right? Uh, in the sense that um, white evangelicals are about 25, 26 percent of the electorate um, consistently since 2008 but their population has shrunk in the overall population to about 15% of America. Uh, so essentially, um, they tend to overperform at the, the voting booth. They, they vote at much higher rates than other Americans. And one way to think about this really is that some 40% of Trump's voters 
came from a group that is only 15% of America. This kind of tells you essentially why Donald Trump, I think, pays so much attention to evangelicals because they make up a disproportionate amount of his supporters there. Other trends with respect to the religious vote, really too quickly, Catholics broke in favor of, of Joe Biden. Joe Biden probably was helped by white Catholics in Pennsylvania, for example, in the upper Midwest. Um, although he, I don't think he got as many white Catholics as I necessarily anticipated. Latino Catholics tended to vote more for, for Joe Biden. And here's the other story that often doesn't get a lot of attention, but people with, um, with no religious affiliation, which is a growing part of the US population, fully two thirds voted for, for Donald, for Joe Biden. And the rate of the performance among the Democratic candidate compared to Clinton was somewhat higher. So you have these, I think, two big forces in the American electorate, white evangelicals compared with the religiously unaffiliated. They're increasingly voting in very different directions. And then getting back to the youth vote here, um, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, 60% uh, of um, young people aged 18 to 29 voted for, for Joe Biden. Um, again, breaking that down by race and ethnicity, you see quite a contrast among white youth a majority of whom still back Donald Trump and young youth of color, uh, BIPOC youth, we might say. Clearly, uh, Biden was the favorite candidate among the black youth vote, Asians and Latinos. This is important to, to look at this because Gen Z, which is defined as Americans of voting age, age 18 to 24, is the most demographically diverse group in American society. And so roughly close to half of Gen Z are, are non-white. And so if you think about a snapshot here of what the vote looks like in uh, 2020, you can just imagine, you know, two to three election cycles from now, I think the outcomes are gonna be very different for one party um, in the future. So this is a chart that was again, um, developed by Circle, the, the folks at Tufts University. And if only young people voted 18 to, to 29, um, clearly uh, Joe Biden would have handily won um, virtually every state. The only um, states where he would not have won among young people are very Southern states here in Indiana um, and Kansas. Okay, so what can we take away from all of this analysis and data from how people voted? So Biden outperformed Trump among all college educated Americans. He did peel away a few white evangelicals slightly, um, but he, get, he made inroads into both the white male vote and into the Catholic vote, which is really important. Trump, however, did much better this year with black men, 6% gain compared to 2016, um, uh, with Asian Americans as well, and also higher income Americans. So as the parties are thinking about 2024, I think that's something to kind of keep, keep in mind. Last but not least, just a few points about the race for Congress. As of this weekend, um, the Democrats overall have lost seven seats in terms of their majority. We're still waiting for um, many races, I, you know, I think 12 to, to 13 still left to be uh, decided here. Um, and so Nancy Pelosi lost, you know, she lost seats in this race. Um, comparatively speaking, in 2018, Democrats won 40 seats from the Republicans, right? So I think that a lot of Democrats were sort of expecting a similar trend from 2018. When Democrats surged, uh, many people feel that this was a direct referendum on, on uh, Donald Trump's performance in office. Um, that did not, that same sort of trend did not materialize in part because you had many more people out to vote in 2020 compared to 2016, 2018. Um, and you had an electorate, all, Trump was literally on the ballot this time. And so that, I think that helped the cause of many Republicans who basically took back districts that Democrats had already taken from them. Many of those, those swing uh, districts there. And as you probably are aware, if you follow politics, um, currently speaking, 48 Democrats have been, uh, are currently now um, will take um, their positions in early January compared to 50 Republicans. Uh, there are two uh, runoff uh, races in Georgia that the entire political world will be focusing on in the next uh, six or seven weeks or so, um, because there are two uh, races featuring uh, the I think John Ossoff versus David Perdue, and then Kelly Loeffler versus, um, I think it's Warnock is the last name. I can't remember the, the first name uh, there. So that's gonna be, I think, an interesting an interesting race to watch. Obviously, if Democrats can pick up both those seats, the control of the Senate will go to Democrats because Kamala Harris serves as president now of the um, president-elect of the Senate. 
Um, and so she would be a, a tie uh, breaking vote there. I wanted to end with a more hopeful picture here. I talked a lot about party polarization and I think the negative things that has brought to American politics, but I like this map of the electoral, of the vote choice. It broken down by county here. Um, this was put together by USA Today. And I think it's a reminder that um, America is a lot more purple than it is red or blue, right? Um, fewer than 600 out of the 3000 counties we have in the United States voted um, over 80% for either candidate. So it's not as though many of us live in districts that are uniformly Democratic or uniformly Republican. In fact, most of us live in areas where parties, on people on both sides of the aisle came out to vote. And so I'd like to think that maybe there's more that brings us together than separates us in some way. So that's something to think about as we turn toward your questions. So with that, I'm going to stop my share. Okay, great. And now is your chance to ask questions or make comments for the presentation. You can either do the chat button or um, you can raise your hand if you're using the participants button there, there's a raise hand feature. Um, or you can unmute yourself and just step in. <laughs> Any questions? Melissa. Yes, there you go. <laughs> uh, I would just be curious to know, do you have any predictions about the uh, two Senate races upcoming in Georgia? Any indications at all at this early stage? Yeah, well, I, I have to think it's going to be hard for Democrats to pull that off. I mean, other results of runoff elections have favored Republican candidates. Having said that, um, I think that many people have pointed to the organizational work of Stacey Abrams in that state. She narrowly lost her election for governor. A lot of people think that maybe some funny business was, was happening, but you know, I don't wanna go there. But she certainly has demonstrated an ability to get into the weeds and to organize incredibly effectively that led to Joe Biden winning that state. So a lot of people didn't think that was going to happen, but, and it was really driven by the youth vote. I talk a lot about the youth vote, but if you look at youth voter turnout, it was huge in the Atlanta area by young people of color. Um, so I think it's within the realm of possibility. Um, I think what helps the Democrats is that one of the candidates, the um, minister um, who is running, I think it's Warnock, I can't believe his name is escaping me right now, but um, I think having an African-American on the ballot might actually help the Democrats overall because I think that that would give maybe more, um, I guess more reason for many people of color to come out and to vote here. Um, what's interesting though is, remember I said that in 2018 you had a surge of voter turnout among Democrats in that election because Donald Trump was not on the ballot? Well, he's not on the ballot this time, right? So maybe that will help the, the Democrats. I think it's gonna still be more difficult knowing the patterns of voting in, in Georgia, um, but it's certainly not without the outside of the realm of possibility. If, if I think you know the youth vote turns out if, if you know, people of color turn out in the similar numbers, then you, know, you could see it happen. Remember though, that in both of those races, um, the one was a, um, like a three-way uh, runoff there. And so neither candidate got a majority um, of the, the Loeffler race, but with Purdue's race, it was, he led slightly like 49 point something percent to John Ossoff. So uh, John Ossoff did not get the most votes in that previous iteration. So. Again, we're gonna have to see. So it's gonna be a lot of, if, if anything is an indication right before I got on my Twitter feed, which I'm trying to take myself away from, which is not healthy. Um, already the pastor, I see very eerie similarities to, you know, um, President Obama's pastor, Jeremiah Wright, right? Um, they're already putting sermons out that he gave. And one of them talks about not liking the military and it was of course taken out of context so it's going to go very dirty very quickly and i think you're going to have a lot of attention being paid to it so we'll, we'll see what happens thank you sure is, is there a, uh, any measurement that has been done on the impact of the republican um, assertion that the democratic party is the socialist party or the democrat Democrats didn't, uh, ones that had demonstrations. Um, well, did that have an impact at all in the congressional elections? 
Okay, so um, that's a really, really good question. Um, a lot of more moderate Democrats, including prominent ones like um, Jim Clyburn from South Carolina, who largely is responsible, I think, for Joe Biden winning the nomination, right? Clyburn has publicly said it's people like AOC that has that damaged um, uh, the ability of Democrats to keep their gains in Congress and cause them to lose seats, right? Uh, uh, progressives like AOC have said, no, in fact, if you look, Joe Biden won places like Michigan and, and Georgia because of outsized voter turnout among young black people who are very progressive, right? So it's like, you can point to data on both sides that kind of show maybe it's a, a net wash. But one thing that is interesting is this theory that um, perhaps voters, you know, like to split the ballot. Maybe they voted for one party for Congress, for, for president, another party for Congress as a way to check each other, right? That essentially adding gridlock to the system. I don't think you can add even more gridlock than we have now, but in, anyway, this is the theory, right? This idea that voters might be more comfortable having one party control one branch and um, the other party controlling the White House. And so PRI, who I mentioned before, uh, they did a, They asked a question on their American values uh, survey. They do this big survey every October. You can, kind of, you can look at it yourself. It's on PRI.org. Um, they asked voters, um, if you were a Biden supporter, so they kind of broke the group down, how important is it for you to have Republicans control Congress, or how important is it for you to have, if you're a Trump backer, um, Democrats control Congress? And very, very little, very few people indicated that they were working to kind of have this collective check on, on each other. I bring that up as a way to say that I think the people that, for example, opposed defund the police were never going to vote for Joe Biden to begin with, right? And I think the people on the far right, if by talking about Joe Biden being a moderate, um, you know, they weren't going to get Joe Biden, they weren't going to go pull the trigger for or pull the lever for, for uh, Joe Biden. So, you know, I don't think there's a lot of good evidence to suggest that, you know, it was the, the socialist brand of the party that got that caused members of Congress, those Democratic members of Congress to lose their House seats. I mean, you have to remember the House seats that they lost, the net of seven, were in very Republican districts that surprisingly went for the Democrat in 2018. So they're more conservative to begin with. So I think it was a return to normal as opposed to a referendum on the Democrats being too uh, leftist per se. This is not to say though that this debate among Democrats, which direction they go, is alive and well, and you're gonna be seeing it play, playing out and it's certainly playing out right now among different factions within the party. I think, generally speaking, it was tamped down because every Democrat pretty much wanted Donald Trump not to, to win again. So they kind of tamped some of that rhetoric down. But already, I think you're seeing a, a divide that was you know, between, between the uh, more progressive wing of the party and the more moderate wing of the party. That probably didn't answer your question, but <laughs> anyway. Do you think that, um... Trump's refusal to accept the results of the election and, and other Republicans refusing to accept the results of the election will affect how people vote for the Senate races in Georgia? That's a good question. Um, I guess it depends on the moderates that are out there, whether that really sort of causes them to, in the independence, if that really causes them to break the Democrats in, in, the, in the Senate. I mean, partisans are going to vote for partisans. We saw in the, the exit polls, 94% of Democrats voted for Biden, 94% voted for, for, for Donald Trump. Um, that could be possibly maybe, you know, the Republican Party is overplaying its hand. I mean, cynically, Mitch McConnell, I think, is indulging the president on this these lawsuits and not acknowledging that Joe Biden's president-elect as a way to get people, um, voters in Georgia, excited about and giving them a reason to go out and vote. These are Republican voters here. But for me, I would say kind of what along the lines of what you're saying is that maybe this will make people that are in the middle say, look, this is not good for, for democracy to, to the unwillingness to acknowledge um, what everybody knows to be the truth, um, possibly. This whole exercise that we're seeing right now as a political scientist who studied American politics for decades, it's really troubling to me. You know, it's one thing to have a, a policy difference. You know, you can talk about tax policy and trade policy and military policy and foreign policy. Um, I wish we would return to that sort of dialogue within um, American politics. But for the for the Republican Party 
to, um, to essentially allow Trump to behave this way, to not call it on its face, um, is really, really troubling. And the result of it is once Trump leaves office, and he won't be here forever, um, I'm now seeing polling data showing that 70 to 80% of Republicans think that the voting is suspect. And we know that it's not suspect, right? We know that it's not. Um, I have friends who study American elections, and um, there are, of course, are a handful of cases, and out of millions and millions of votes cast every year, that might not look correct. But, but to say that there's wholesale widespread fraud is, is really nonsensical, and it's, it's damaging to, to the country. So once Trump leaves office, if we're left with an America in which a significant portion of the electorate no longer trusts the results, that's really troubling. And I'm not sure what we do with that sort of thing. You know, um, when I hear that Republicans in the Senate are fist bumping um, Kamala Harris yesterday when she was there to vote on, on, on a candidate that lost to the Fed um, and secretly congratulating Joe Biden elect, um, to me, that's, that's just, that's not the right thing to do. And so I'm hoping the better angels will emerge here. Um, all of the court cases that the Trump administration has been um, trying to get through the system have been thrown out because there's not one shred of evidence, right? <laughs> that any of them have any sort of merit. Um, but to indulge Trump in this sort of thing to me has really dangerous implications for the future of, the, of, our, of our democracy. I think the biggest thing I've been surprised about by this presidency regardless if you support the policies or not. Um, I've heard scholars talk about the norms of the office being the soft guardrails of democracy and the sheer number of violations um, that have been allowed to amass um, are really troubling to me. We'll have to see. I think if Democrats were to gain control of the Senate, there has been talk about trying to legislatively put some sort of breaks in place in terms of the, the future occupants of the White House. So one example is the Inspector General's office. So Trump has fired five Inspector Generals um, since he's been president. That law was put into place after Watergate as a way to have a nonpartisan group examine malfeasance and poor practices in the executive branch. Um, but if a president decides to fire and mass the Inspector Generals who are looking into things that he or she's not happy about, that clearly is problematic. So that could be a reform, for example, that could come after the Trump presidency. You could have laws that require presidents to actually take their businesses and put them in law. I mean, so there are things that can be done to, to get some of them, but I'm not sure how you handle the norms of not telling the truth or name calling or how you bring back civility in, in American politics, which is something that I'm really very concerned about as well. That went well beyond the Georgia case, sorry. <laughs> but anyway. So any thoughts on, I see some pictures here um, on the drivers for men of color to vote for Donald Trump. Um, yes, yeah, so this is a, a talk that a lot of people are, there's gonna be a rash of papers, I'm sure, among political scientists about this topic. In fact, I'm gonna be writing one with my new colleague, Flavio Hickel in the political science department. He's an expert on Latinos and their um, political views and voting behavior. And we're gonna look at sort of the idea of whether the machismo of Donald Trump is what has led some uh, Latino voters to, to back in male voters, at least. Um, but when it comes to men of color, you know, we had my friend Eric McDaniel on the talk last month um, for the Goldstein panel. He's an expert on the black vote, and he's written a lot about the role of the black church in American politics. And so he basically thinks that among older black voters who turn out in mass, um, their experience of the civil rights movement is so profound and memorable that that has made them the most loyal Democratic voters to be had. Whereas younger Black voters, and, and especially younger male Black voters, um, because they haven't lived through that, um, they're less, I think, loyal to the Democratic Party in some respects. And so um, I think that there's something to be had for kind of parsing that out. I'll be interested to see, to see what some of the studies are. I think also younger Black Americans, like other younger Americans, are far less likely to be religiously affiliated. And so you have the Black church, which is heavily democratic. And so if you have younger African Americans who are less religious, that might also be explaining, I think, some of the fall off of support among uh, younger Black male voters there. So it's a trend we're going to have to keep our eye on. Overwhelmingly, though, most African Americans voted for, for Joe Biden. That's not a shock. But it was a little bit of a surprise to see Trump kind of 
getting into some of the the black vote, especially of course, considering things like Charlottesville and you know the the dog whistles that came out of the White House. Um, so we'll have to see. Other questions. Uh, Melissa, this Hanson. Um, I wrote wrote one. Uh, why was New York so low in voting per percentage? And they, your first slide showed that. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know New York's um, voter uh, laws very well. So, um, but I would say it would probably have to do with how difficult it is to to register to vote. I mean, all the studies in political science are pretty clear. If you make it easier to register, you know, voter turnout uh, will be higher. I think the miraculous thing to me about this election is that with the pandemic, a lot of people thought that maybe voter turnout wouldn't be as high because people might fear going to the to the uh, voting booth or what have you. Um, but you know, so but still we had this remarkable surge in, in voting overall, and part of that was due to most states, not all, like Texas, made it very difficult to vote by mail this election cycle. Um, most states basically said, look, because of the pandemic, you can get access to the mail-in vote. So I think that, that certainly helped in a lot of ways. I'm trying to think if I have any friends that teach in any universities in New York, and I don't. So that, those would be my go-tos to ask. <laughs> Other questions? I can't ask, answered everyone's questions, my goodness. I think a lot of people were just drinking from the fire hose of the information you gave them. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I probably went too quickly. No, it was great, thank you very much. Of course. Could you talk a little more about why evangelicals support Trump so heavily when he is probably one of the most unchristian people in the country? Ah, yes, sure. I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, I think that for many evangelicals, um, Trump has actually delivered in terms of policy in ways that previous presidents have not, including George W. Bush, who himself um, is, an, is a white evangelical, right? And so um, Trump's willingness to appoint pro-life judges to the bench, his moving of the US embassy in, in uh, Israel to Jerusalem, um, his willingness to go to federal court to sort of block initiatives that will help LGBTQ rights, um, all of these sorts of, of moves um, and also the idea that he has, I think, perpetuated this notion that in American society, white Christians are the most persecuted group in American uh, politics today, that there's this idea of religious freedom. And so it's not surprising, for example, during the campaign, a lot of people on the religious right were saying that, you know, with the pandemic, um, most democratically controlled states are closing churches, but letting, you know, bars open or something like that. Um, you know, which is not necessarily true. But this notion that I think for many white evangelicals, they feel besieged in American culture. They see the culture changing in terms of the racial component, um, more people being less religious, like this growth of the religiously unaffiliated is huge, especially affecting younger Americans. And so for them, when Donald Trump talks about making America great again, it's sort of that again part that they, they talk about. He gives them recognition in ways that I think other presidents have not in the past. And so they've been willing to overlook um, his personal behavior uh, because for them, they're given access to the White House, they're given policies that they care about. And so it has, and also to add to that, there's a rash of new studies that talk about this notion of Christian nationalism that essentially for some conservative Christians, the idea is that um, America should be a Christian nation that we should advocate for policies that sort of um, that isolates us from the world that really promotes you know patriotism. Um, part of it is linked to racial resentment, all of that together. And so these things I think have combined um, to create for many evangelicals this notion that Republican being a Republican is also part of their social identity. 
which I don't think is healthy, but I think it's an explanation for why we are where we are. I wanna say though, that there've been many uh, conservative Christians and many evangelicals who have broken away from that. Who, you know, One great example is Michael Gerson. He was a speechwriter for George W. Bush. He's a columnist now at the Washington Post, has been consistently critical of Donald Trump from the beginning, basically saying part of what being a Christian is, is trying to basically promote people who are ethical and moral. And here's a man who is, many people would say is neither of those things, right? Um, and so that's, I think, why there's been an enormous amount of attention to how evangelicals who 20 years ago were leading the charge, right, for, for Bill Clinton to be impeached because of an affair with an intern, how they can, you know, defend and support this man. And not just defend and support him, but champion him, right? I mean, there's within, I think, some evangelical circles, you know, he is viewed as uh, someone who was put in place by God, right? And so, um, but there's always that kind of that disconnect there. Someone asked, do you think the current increased cases of COVID is related to the election? Um, I think the current increased cases of COVID is related to the fact that lots of people don't wear masks. So, and I'm guessing that if people went to vote and they weren't wearing a mask, that probably could have led to, to some increased cases. Um, you know, my understanding is that, and again, I've had friends who served as election judges. Um, most states were pretty strict about wearing masks and making sure you wore the mask and that sort of thing. So I think the protocols were in place. Um, um, I think that, again, the increased number of cases is because people are fatigued, they're not taking the warning seriously, they're meeting with their family and friends in large gatherings, which we know spreads the disease. Um, and it doesn't help, of course, when the current president essentially um, and is, is saying that masks don't really work, right, or is not promoting them uh, and their usage. Other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, Melissa, I just want to thank you so much for giving us a, a, a great summary of uh, what's going on and, and raising some more questions uh, as we go along. Thank you so much. Oh, it's always a pleasure to talk with you guys. Thanks for being an attentive audience and um, please stay healthy and, and safe, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye. It was Thank great. You. great. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. It was oh, great. great. Thank you. Bye, Melissa. Dan, thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction. That was very uh, great. It was, it was a, <laughs> I'm so pleased. <laughs> oh, same to you. Yes to Rita. Bye. Hanson, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, take care. Love to the family. <laughs> thank you, Hanson. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. <laughs>